Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's webinar from Data Color Panoramic Capture with Nikon Evangelist Michael Eftelyaris. I'm Boris Bergman from, Nick, uh, from uh, Data Color, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. First, allow me to give you a short overview about the upcoming next 60 minutes. Here are that you know who's talking. It's Michael and me here tonight. And uh, we will start now with the presentation from Michael. And after that presentation, uh, we will uh, go into a chat where you have the possibility to enter all the questions you have. And Michael and I we will answer them truthfully. Okay, so it's now time for Michael. So it's Michael now to share your screen with us. So please, Michael, it's your turn now. Thank okay. you. Okay. For everybody, I'm just uh, setting up my presentation here, as you can see in keynotes. Anyway, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well, wherever you are in the world. Uh, this is actually the first time I do this, so I've, I've got a little bit uh, nervous. But um, anyway, um, I'm uh, Michael Elefteriadis, as you see there, and uh, this presentation is about, you know, a, a kind of defining moment in my life and in my career uh, as, a, as a sort of working uh, photographer. So um, the, uh, the first part of the presentation will be uh, not too technical, but it will be a little bit technical. Uh, and uh, just to kind of explain a little bit about the panoramic process, and then we'll actually look at the pictures. But I thought it would be also more interesting to talk to you a little bit about Japan, which is actually one of my uh, favorite countries. I've had an, a, a sort of fascination for uh, everything uh, Japanese since I was a child. Um, so uh, I think you'll see a sort of interesting uh, side of, of the country. Anyway, um, one of the things that I do, uh, I'm uh, based in London and uh, I, uh, I have an association with uh, Nikon Owner magazine and with uh, Nikon UK. Um, for uh, Nikon Owner is, is a wonderful uh, publication and uh, pr probably one of the highest quality photographic publications I think uh, around and uh, you can actually see there's two of the articles there that were written by me. Uh, so the, uh, the actual trip uh, to Japan which you'll see uh, the pictures of uh, was actually something that was uh, partly sponsored by uh, Nikon because obviously we, we have a, a close relationship with Nikon uh, and they invited us to go and see their uh, manufacturing facilities. So um, I thought uh, you might want to a glimpse of view of what I look like but at the end you'll actually see exactly what I look like but this is how I looked when I was traveling in Japan and I thought you might like to see uh, what kind of equipment um, I usually carry uh, and I carried uh, a lot of this uh, in Japan uh, but obviously a Nikon SLR, uh, I travel usually light with two or three lenses um, at the time I had uh, DX lenses, now I've, I've moved to uh, full frame and you'll see there the 360 precision panoramic head. This was probably about a, about half a year to a year after 360 precision. A, a UK manufacturer started making these wonderful panoramic heads. Um, and I started working with 360 precision and I started using their equipment, which, which I, I do to this day. Uh, a, a light Manfrotto carbon fiber tripod, some filters, uh, various bits and pieces. And the Data Color Spider Cube, uh, which I think is a really great little gadget, and I will be showing you how exactly I, I make use of it in my in my work. Um, now, all of this stuff, would you believe, particularly because the heads were very very heavy at the time, uh, this probably weighed about 13, 14 kilos. And uh, I think the only difference with nowadays is that cameras have gotten lighter. Uh, so actually I carry a lighter load today than I used to at the time. 
so other things that I think that are important, um, a, a uh, weatherproof uh, overalls um, and really comfortable walking shoes and I also like these expandable water bottles uh, which basically as, as you use them up they get smaller and smaller so they take up less space uh, and if you're in a hot place also they cool uh, your equipment so that's an additional plus. Okay, so um, these are the uh, 360 precision heads uh, that I uh, that I used, and uh, just to uh, explain what's going on here, um, the um, I, I don't know whether I have a laser pointer. No, I don't. Uh, but uh, on the left hand side, you see a camera set up for a cylindrical uh, acquisition, which is basically when the camera just rotates and does a cylinder. And uh, the advantage there is with a, uh, quite a wide lens, uh, the advantage is you can actually put in a filter. Um, with spherical acquisition, which what you see on the right, uh, we have the ability to actually shoot both um, up and below. So we get a sphere, a full sphere. So it's a bit more work to uh, stitch the images together. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, photograph, if you like, lends itself to doing uh, photospheres and also uh, doing um, uh, exporting basically for uh, web use where you can actually feel as if you're actually in the picture. So um, the only thing that changes between these two uh, is the plate on which the camera sits because the lens is different. So I actually took a number of plates with me to Japan and I changed uh, each plate according to uh, the method that I was going to use. So um, I thought it might be useful for you to see uh, the three main different types of panoramas. So um, on the top we have what's called a planar panorama which is a flat panorama and these are usually shot uh, with PC, with perspective control lenses. So the camera is stationary and that means that uh, the perspective doesn't change. So uh, the lens moves to the left, you shoot one image to the left, one in the middle and one to the right or you can just two, do, do two. Uh, but um, the, the main benefit here is that the stitch is perfect and you can do this very, very easily. You don't need a stitching program to do it. The middle picture is what's called a cylindrical uh, panorama and this is where, where the camera rotates. It doesn't have to rotate the whole way around but this in this picture it, it does so that's a 360 degree view. Uh, but in a cylinder you can see we don't see the top and the bottom. So cylinders are useful for uh, certain types of landscapes uh, where uh, you don't really uh, find anything interesting on the top and on the bottom of the, uh, of the location. Uh, finally, the spherical panorama uh, is the one that m is most distorted at the top and on the bottom because what you have to imagine here is that this is actually a sphere, right? A, a whole sphere that's been unrolled. So obviously as the edges meet on the top of the picture you get the most distortion. Um, and one of the interesting things also about spherical pictures is that they're always the same aspect. The aspect is always two to one, so two horizontal and one vertical. One other thing to note is the yellow lines and the yellow lines obviously describe the horizon. Uh, so that's exactly the level that I used for my camera. And you'll see uh, what is consistent across all panoramas is that the center line uh, where the horizon is, uh, you have no distortion, it's always correct, right? Whereas if you look on the cylindrical and the spherical, you get uh, this telltale sign that it's a panorama, this uh, curved uh, barrel type distortion, um, which um, you know, shows that it is, it is a panorama. So uh, this slide uh, just shows you the advantages and disadvantages, if you like, of each method. So planar has no distortion, a very easy overlap and a very natural perspective. Uh, the cylindrical, um, it gives you a wider view um, and out of the two, the spherical or the cylindrical, it's the easiest to stitch. And this is great for exhibition type of work or if you want to do high resolution uh, images. 
Uh, the spherical uh, is the hardest to stitch because you have to stitch the top and the bottom and this is the best option for immersive uh, for virtual reality applications where you know you want to show to people what it's like to be in there in that space. Uh, something else that's interesting uh, is that um, with the DX type cameras uh, because the sensor is smaller you actually have to take more shots so um, the FX cameras give you a benefit of uh, fewer shots um, which basically means you can uh, you know finish your work a, li a little bit more quickly and uh, this is a picture that actually shows the process um, so it shows the number of shots so for a spherical uh, acquisition I have eight uh, all the way around so we start from the top one two three four five six seven eight that describes the the circle and then we have one uh, of the top and then we have three on the bottom you might say why three on the bottom that's slightly unusual well um, the two middle bottom shots uh, are the ones that are used to remove part the part of the panoramic head that's showing and the third picture is actually one where the tripod is moved so that I can get a picture of the ground so if you see the next slide here this is just describing how we create the illusion that the camera is floating in space without a tripod so this is basically the method to remove the tripod so um, having the two first exposures that you see the first and the second when we subtract uh, one from the other we get picture three which just shows basically the tripod with the head being removed and then if I move on to the next slide we go through a process where we export a cubic uh, process a cubic image in the process right as you can see the uh, uh, fisheye distortion is removed and then that makes it easy to use the the last picture that I showed you which is the picture of the ground right um, applied to the third picture so that the ground uh, the the tripod is removed and you know you don't actually see the the tripod so uh, one of the cool things and this is what I enjoy about panoramic capture is once you have your panorama you can do a lot of things with it and um, uh, you can create what's called a panosphere uh, by using uh, Photoshop and the polar coordinates filter which just basically wraps it and as you will see in my work uh, I use this a lot because it's like as if you are able to image a different picture whether you're looking uh, inwards or outwards uh, if you like don't worry this will make sense afterwards um, when we view uh, the picture in either an HTML5 uh, um, uh, web page or in uh, VR or in flash basically the distortion is removed so that it gives the viewer the feeling that they're looking through uh, the window so uh, I thought also you might like to know that um, I'm a, you know obviously a big fan of uh, data color products and I actually use all of these in my workflow uh, you'll see how I use the spider cube and the spider cube is actually the the kind of most useful thing for me for for this type of uh, uh, photography uh, but I also use the spider checker but the spider checker I use more for um, uh, studio work and if I'm doing portraiture um, I use the spider lens cal for calibrating uh, my lenses and uh, I uh, you know it's, it's an important aspect of what I do every new lens that I buy goes through a, a testing procedure just to find out that it's you know just to make sure that it's working fine uh, with my camera bodies um, and uh, I also use the spider for elite uh, to um, basically calibrate my screen uh, because that's a really really important aspect of your workflow uh, you know to make sure that you're actually seeing accurate color on the screen um, I recently upgraded to a, a new ISO display and I'm, I was very pleased to find out that the spider actually works with the ISO so the spider so the the ISO uses the spider as the means with which to calibrate itself uh, finally, spider print. I uh, I don't profile all my papers, but I do profile the important papers when I do an exhibition of my panoramic prints. 
Um, and what I find is that with uh, the creation of your own profiles, yes, it takes a bit of time to do it, but you do get a greater dynamic range on the prints. Um, it's a small difference, but you know it is worth uh, doing. So uh, this is how I use the Spider Cube. Um, probably, maybe not the intended use, but. Um, what I do uh, before I photograph a scene uh, is I put it on the tripod as you see there um, and I take a picture and I obviously check my exposure um, I have a hunch usually about what it should be and um, what that gives me is it gives me a point of reference uh, the gray part on the top um, when I view the pictures in, uh, in camera raw uh, afterwards is it gives me a neutral uh, white balance. So if I shoot in a space where there is no white, um, so I have no point of reference, I have no way of knowing what the right white balance was, uh, I just basically click on the gray parts on the top. But the other thing that's useful, um, I use the white parts of the cube to tell me where uh, I've reached saturation in, on the sensor and uh, Nikon cameras have a view uh, which is called highlight control, highlight view and basically the display blinks where you've got um, basically too much light and um, having a little bit of blinking is not a bad thing because it actually shows you that you've reached the limit of your sensor and it's, it's a good thing because you know you're actually using your camera's widest dynamic range so uh, having a lot of blinking is bad because you get a blown sky and things like that but having a little bit of blinking is good so uh, I let it I let it blink a little bit that's what I do and you know the histogram shows me as you see on the bottom left there it shows me that, that I've got a nice broad uh, histogram uh, finally and this is something that I only use in post uh, the shadow uh, the the spider cube has a little hole through which you know that is the blackest the darkest part of the picture so it just helps me to uh, keep the contrast under control to have the widest contrast that I possibly can. So uh, let's now move on to uh, Japan. That's the technical bit out of the way. Uh, so now let's have a bit of fun. Uh, so um, this is my um, architectural project at university and it was a sumo wrestling theater. That's part of the time when the fascination started and this is obviously a place where sumo fighters uh, wrestle. And uh, uh, some of my favorite movies, obviously uh, Blade Runner, um, Lost in Translation, um, which actually has a scene which you'll see later on in my pictures, uh, and Memoirs of a Geisha, which actually appeared uh, a few years before. Um, and you'll see the picture on the bottom right because that became kind of the, uh, you know, the the image of the of the trip, the defining moment. Uh, just a, a little bit about Japan. Uh, it's it's a, not a huge country, but it's a very very long country. It covers a huge area from top to bottom, as you can see, from the cool to the uh, relatively mild, warm, temperate in the middle to the subtropical hot. And as you'll see there in the picture, uh, Japan is actually at a junction of four different plates, which are all moving. And this is why, of course, uh, there are a lot of earthquakes and tsunamis in Japan. Uh, these are all the places that uh, I visited uh, with uh, my fellow photographers. So we started off in Tokyo. And uh, this is day one, right? So the first uh, visit was the famous Tsukichi uh, market, which is uh, just an awesome sight. Uh, very, very busy. We were there in the early morning. Uh, it's very colorful and the uh, the guys that move all of the freight uh, use these kinds of uh, uh, kind of trolley-like devices with these huge uh, steering wheels. And uh, you know, when I'm not shooting panoramas, I basically shoot colorful uh, details like you see here. The uh, wonderful Japanese packaging and uh, this is you know this is 
again, I, I think just the, the, the picture of, of that moment in time because I love the precision with which these guys cut the actual um, uh, fish. It's kind of like a, a modern day samurai. And this is what uh, a tuna slice actually looks like, which is it's amazing because it actually looks like red meat. Um, so this is uh, one of the first uh, panoramas that I took. Um, I'm going to be showing you uh, more of these later, but this is a partial uh, panorama. So this would have been shot out of four or five uh, pictures. And I'm not interested in the back here because, you know, that's actually the, you know, the hotel room. So there isn't anything interesting in there. I'm just interested in the view. So this is actually a 180 degree uh, panorama. Uh, this was the first place we uh, visited after the, uh, the the fish market, and it's uh, it's one of the famous uh, temples in Tokyo, Asakusa. Again, very bright conditions, which uh, I don't like. I prefer more kind of diffuse light. So uh, you know, I go behind the scenes and I shoot uh, masks, Japanese masks here from the famous Kibuki theater and again I love I love the way they um, you know the precision with which they make things in Japan and I love these boxes of uh, probably sweets okay so uh, this is my first uh, spherical panorama and this is uh, a tempura restaurant the first place we we had uh, lunch and uh, I'm just going to show you uh, how that actually looks uh, as a spherical panorama just so that you can get an idea of how it looks. So uh, actually I can, we can view this uh, full screen. All right, so uh, you know with a spherical panorama we have this wonderful ability to um, look and even zoom in and have a look at what everybody is actually having. And as you can see, the, the camera was set up on a tripod, as you can see in the middle, but the tripod using the method that I showed you has been removed. So it gives you the impression that uh, my camera is actually floating in space. It gives you this kind of result. Now, I don't know, uh, and this is kind of an experiment. Uh, uh, I spoke with Boris, and this has never been shown before, so I hope I hope you can see this quickly. I hope uh, you have, uh, you know, the refresh is, is quite good where, wherever you're viewing this, um, and you can actually see the result. Now, of course, that's what all photographers have, a lot of uh, camera bags on the side. So, day two. Uh, day two was about our visit to uh, Sendai. So, I've got a, a, a piece here by uh, Hitatoshi Kato called The Machine Cult, the book. And uh, it goes like, to the people of Japan, machines are priceless friends. In many ways, the daily life of the Japanese people today is controlled by computers. And the Japanese people themselves feel no sense of strangeness or repulsion at this phenomenon. In fact, most Japanese revel in the convenience and pleasantness provided in their lives. So, um, the Japanese, by tradition, uh, they are very, very good, as we know, uh, about making things, particularly very, very small things. Uh, and it's something that's been in the culture for uh, hundreds of years. And uh, this is why, in my view, uh, my opinion, you know, they're very good at making uh, cameras and, and uh, because, you know, they require that level of precision um, that uh, uh, makes the, these things possible. Anyway, so this is uh, Sendai in the north of uh, Japan and uh, Matsushima Bay. So here's uh, our arrival at the uh, Sendai factory, which is where uh, Nikon professional products are made, the professional cameras. Uh, these are the engineers uh, that we met, uh, which were really wonderful. Um, they gave us gifts. They took us around the factory. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the factory to show you. 
uh, because I wasn't allowed to take pictures. Um, so, uh, but but basically, what you would have seen is mostly ladies uh, standing um, and putting sub assemblies together uh, to make the uh, top of the line model at the time, which was the uh, Nikon D two X. And uh, again, here's the group uh, actually uh, about to uh, say goodbye as we were leaving. And uh, this was um, uh, this is showing you a view of above of uh, Matsushima Bay, uh, and you'll see why I'm showing you this in a moment. But um, again, when I can't find anything. Um, interesting to photograph and at this point I have to say I did not have a plan about this trip at all so I was really more like a tourist uh, I just take details and I love these exquisite details of um, this particular temple Godaido temple um, I heard because this area was devastated by the tsunami of a few years ago uh, that the traditional temples like this are so well made that actually we're still standing, whereas a lot of the other buildings were swept away. Uh, again, another detail, um, and usually um, Japanese roofs have uh, an emblem uh, or they have uh, something like this to ward off the, the evil um, spirits. And I, I like this uh, again because, uh, again, compositionally, I think I, I enjoy this picture. Um, but um, again, it's it's all about materials. And uh, this is another picture that I enjoyed, uh, uh, which is this tree. Which uh, somehow I've never seen a tree like this, but it's almost like a naked. It has, it has a form that's like a naked body, and this beautiful light. And I like the fact that it's duplicated in shadow on the uh, right-hand side. So this is uh, Matsushima Bay, uh, and this bay has thousands of islands, most, most of which are tiny. And at some point, uh, our guide brought out these um, uh, crisps, which were uh, made out of something uh, fishy. Right, and I had no idea what was going to happen, but it was very exciting because uh, one of the ladies uh, that was with us started to feed the seagulls, and it was just an awesome moment. Now, it was very chaotic, so this was really about um, you know getting a shot that works, and I like this shot because um, every bird seems to occupy its own space. Um, you know, uh, the sun was setting, so we have beautiful diffuse light from the left-hand side, as you can see. And you know, this is a, a uh, you know a cool, decisive moment, in my opinion. Um, and this one, a little bit more contrasty. Uh, so again, a wonderful effect. You can actually see through the bird's feathers, which I enjoy. And uh, this was evening, the evening, uh, having dinner, traditional Japanese dinner. And uh, I remember this being really, really strange because we had no idea what we were eating. And after we had this wonderful food, they arrived with a really special, huge dish, which was, uh, they told us it was whale meat. And when they told us it was whale meat, nobody got up to try it, <laughs> which was quite funny. Uh, and uh, you know this is this was the hotel, traditional Japanese, of course, uh, uh, all all screens and uh, you know wonderful futon. So great, great experience. So day three, um, we are now moving south, uh, close to Kyoto. We're in the mountains, and uh, these are the traditional uh, houses with um, thatch roofs and. The reason they have this shape uh, and the reason they have this angle is uh, so that they, you know, so that the uh, snow can actually come off um, and not put too much load onto the structure. So uh, everything has a reason for being. Uh, so it's another shot of Miyama village. And, uh, and another. 
And these, I think, are again lucky uh, charms. Uh, they're there to uh, give luck uh, to the locals and possibly to ward off um, evil. So now we move on to Kyoto, which is a really lovely city. Uh, it's quite huge, as you can see. And again, if you were to try to go to all the temples in Kyoto, you'll be there for a very, very long time. So we visited, as you can see, about seven or eight of them. Uh, and uh, this is um, a good time to visit. Uh, we visited in April, which is uh, the cherry blossom time, so um, it's a nice superimposition here of the white and the black. And what's interesting is that the Buddhist temples, as you can see here, are predominantly this color. Uh, and the Shinto, which is the, uh, the original, if you like, the native religion of Japan, are uh, orange and white. Again, these beautiful colors. And uh, this is a panorama uh, of that superimposition um, of those two uh, religions, the Buddhist and the Shinto, and most Japanese actually are happy to believe in both. Um, and, um, you know, this is what I think a panorama is fantastic for. Uh, because um, you would not be able to capture a view like this with your normal, um, even with your normal wide-angle lens or, or a normal lens. Um, and uh, a panorama just makes it possible. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to at this stage just, you know, show the fact that these two um, happily um, coexisted, coexist still. Um, and uh, this is another famous temple in Kyoto, the Golden Pavilion, as it's called. Um, you know, absolutely meticulous and clean and lovely, and the, this, this is what all these gardens are, are like. So uh, here we have uh, a seller, um, a street seller, selling uh, good luck charms, which the Japanese buy and they write a message and they actually put it in as, a, as an offering there. And these are called Emma boards in Japanese. And uh, well, this is a, a, again a, a sort of typical technique of uh, using a frame to actually show uh, and actually to um, kind of put order in chaos, if you like. It's a bit chaotic at the back, but this just gives it order. Um, and uh, you'll start to see little glimpses of Japanese there, uh, people taking pictures, because they love this period of time. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about uh, Japan is that, you know, you don't feel, um, you know, kind of conscious of taking pictures, because the Japanese have cameras themselves, and some of them have more than one camera, and they'll have a mobile phone, and they took as many pictures as uh, we did, which is quite funny. So again, um, lady on the right has two mobile phones. Uh, one is not enough, and the lady on the left taking pictures of the cherry blossom. Uh, so we, we had a lot of fun, and you know the Japanese also made fun of us because we always joked we we've got bigger lenses than than you have. <laughs> uh, so this is again a, a child. Uh, I don't know what it says on the sign, but uh, again it was a, a nice moment in uh, in orange there. Uh, another famous uh, Buddhist temple, of course, a, a contemplative garden, um, which is Ryoan Ji uh, Temple, which has these beautiful manicured um, gardens, and people just sit, and they, you know, it makes you think about life and, and you know, what's important to you. And uh, this was the seminal moment for me. I was looking for a nice composition, and I saw this lady there who was uh, looking intensely um, at the uh, rock formations. And uh, you know, I think I, you know, I just tried to do as, as best a composition um, as I could. And I don't think you need to see her face, because you instantly know uh, what's happening. And uh, this is a, a, a sort of fun uh, moment, if you like. The lady on the top there is actually our guide. Uh, and again, I like the composition of the black uh, taxi uh, with the driver on the top right and the Japanese lettering on the streets uh, behind. 
so this is one of the temples that I showed you earlier. Uh, I think this was in uh, Lost in Translation. And again, these are uh, messages of luck uh, put in on the front. And this is another example where um, it's not important to shoot uh, spherical because if you shoot spherical, all you get is a, is a bland uh, sky and um, there's no interesting foreground. So in this case, I choose to do a, a cylinder. And um, this was enjoyable in a sense because the sky and the ground look very, very similar. And you'll actually see something quite funny. I don't know whether you can uh, spot this, but um, because the camera rotates and I take multiple shots, uh, there's one guy in the picture that appears three times. <laughs> so uh, let me uh, just show you this panorama. So uh, I believe it's this one. So let's go to full frame. So this just gives you uh, an idea of what it's like to be there. You know, it's kind of the nearest thing. Uh, Of course, um, the more panoramas you do, uh, you learn how to uh, do this very, very quickly because when there's a lot of movement, um, it gets much harder to put the images together. Uh, but, um, you know, from experience, I can now probably shoot a scene like this uh, probably in less than 20 seconds, 25 seconds, something like that. But I do take time to, uh, you know, check the exposure, do a white balance check, uh, you know, make sure that everything is in place. Okay, and at night uh, there were these wonderful um, light shows at another temple, and um, you know, I actually walked with with our guide. Um, and um, I was single at the time, and uh, there was a certain closeness, I'd say, uh, between us, um, and uh, I remember, you know, she was freezing cold. Um, we did not expect it to be cold at night um, in Kyoto, but it was, and I gave her my jacket, and it was a great moment because then I was freezing, uh, but she said to me, you know, you, you are an English gentleman, she said, and of course the Japanese associated associate Britain, you know, with the royal family and, you know, being a gentleman and it was, it was, you know, quite enjoyable. So this is what the Japanese love. This is the adoration of the cherry blossom tree, which was beautifully lit at night and people were just gathering around, uh, viewing and taking pictures of this beautiful tree. But um, what I mentioned uh, about, you know, feelings of love beginning to kind of uh, appear, um, uh, I, I should point out this is not love to a particular person, but I just began to feel a closeness between my own beliefs uh, and what I actually saw in Japan. So there was a certain closeness beginning to develop, and I think that actually helped me uh, in my photography. So, uh, this is another uh, excerpt here from a book, and it's about Japanese behavior. So, the mechanism of Japanese behavior resembles the playing of a game. Principles are not an issue. All that matters is the rules. The ultimate pleasure is to respect, follow, and become absorbed in those rules. Once the game becomes established, it is made even more complicated, refined, and finally becomes an obsession. So, um, it's kind of hard for us to understand, but what we do see in Japan is that people learn uh, to follow rules uh, from when they're very, very young. And the rules govern everything from how they sit, how they speak, uh, you know, uh, every, every single thing has a, has a rule behind it. There are literally thousands of rules. And, you know, it, it is an obsession to be good uh, and, and to... Um, basically follow uh, these uh, these rules. So, Kyoto. Um, <clears throat> this is, I think, a good moment again because I started to feel more in control of, of the process um, and um, I think this is beginning to come through in my photography. So, this is Serio G Temple 
and uh, I want to show you the panorama and explain why I actually took this spherical. Uh, but uh, one of the uh, interesting things about uh, Buddhist temples is that they have a very, very strong axis. So um, architecturally speaking, um, there is um, a clearly defined relationship between buildings and this tends to be north-south. Uh, so this is a Buddhist temple because it's dark, darker color, darker wood as you can see and basically what this panorama is about is about this axis as you can see. So it's actually just recording um, this particular axis. So of course there was where my tripod was, of course it's been erased. but. It's just a picture that defines that viewpoint, that axis. And what you're actually seeing here is actually a photosphere, which is, as I said before, it's a technique in Photoshop which allows you to show a 360 degree image uh, as a sphere. And you can define where you want to do this from, from top or bottom or whatever. And uh, I think these pictures are remarkable. I do enjoy seeing them because they, they, it's not apparent, but it actually shows you a full sphere. So you can actually see both in front of you and behind you at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure what these are, but I just enjoyed this as a, as a composition. Uh, they may be shoes, they may be sandals, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I just want to show you another uh, example here. So this is uh, Kameyama Park and um, because um, these places were so uh, wonderful and so uh, kind of unreal, it was almost like an imagine a, imagined space and um, uh, I feel that the sphere actually works because it, it almost shows like an idealized view of the world. And what you'll see, uh, the next picture is actually the same information. So it's the same photograph, but just imaged in the opposite way. So this is looking up and this one is looking down. Um, I don't know which one you'd prefer, I'd be interested to know, but um, this makes it look like a, a little planet. Uh, uh, and I, I, I can show you the uh, panorama. So here is the panorama. So now you're actually seeing uh, the corrected view. Um, so you don't get the distortion. Uh, I'm trying not to move it too fast just so that you have uh, a quite a good refresh rate where you are. And, uh, you know, I'm mindful of time, we are, you know, we're at 45 past, so, uh, yeah, so again, uh, you know, just the ability to do this, it makes me feel like I was there, and I hope, you know, I hope you get the same uh, feeling. Uh, one little thing, again, I do um, is um, if there's a very strong sun in the picture, I just position myself so that the sun is just behind a branch, uh, right, just to decrease the light level in the picture uh, slightly. Okay. So uh, now we're moving on to the tea ceremony and uh, what is the tea ceremony? So let's just uh, have a look at this. Um, he said, teaism is a cult founded on the adoration of the beautiful among the sordid facts of everyday existence. This means that the tea ceremony is both life and art. So um, you know, the Japanese love the, the tea ceremony. It's a, it's a very traditional thing um, and uh, what happened was uh, I was uh, walking along at one of the uh, temples and I noticed that um, there was a, a, a gate and I, I went in and I saw these uh, geishas and maikos and maiko is a trainee geisha and um, you know they were bringing uh, tea uh, to the tourists that were coming in and um, you know 
these girls just to see uh, again the the beautiful makeup that they put on and the exquisite way that they're dressed with their kimonos and this girl's uh, hair matched with the uh, cherry blossom behind uh, you know it was unreal and I, I felt kind of amazing I felt that this was an amazing scene to see these wonderful girls uh, and on the picture on the left, you actually see a detail of the uh, the makeup on the neck. Uh, and on the right, it was kind of uh, I, I I was uh, kind of pleasantly surprised to see that I actually had two portraits. So there were actually two girls in the picture, and they were nicely kind of superimposed. So uh, this is actually the uh, I think the defining uh, moment for me uh, because. Um, this ended up being, I think, the, the, the great picture, if you like, and certainly this is the feedback that I've had. But this is shooting, uh, there's a, a place where, which is a, a park which is called Arashiyama, and there's the famous bamboo forest, and this is where there was a scene in Memos of a Geisha where she drives in the car, and this is just wide enough for a car to go through. and. Uh, you know, uh, if you shot this with your normal camera, it would actually look like this because the bamboo is actually very, very close to you. So c you can only really shoot details. Uh, but with my spherical panorama technique, um, I got a picture which um, was obviously very unusual. And all this is, it's a, it's a photosphere, so it's a spherical image. Uh, and it's just been cropped in, in a rectangle, so it looks like a normal picture. So let me show you the uh, panorama, just so that you can see for yourselves. So um, the, uh, what happened here was that I set my tripod right in the middle of the road, and occasionally I had to move the tripod because there were cars going past, and um, I checked my exposure. It was actually quite dark down here, but it was quite bright, as you can see. Um, but I don't mind the fact that it's um, like this here because it actually shows it like the eye saw it. So it's more natural, I think, to leave it like this. Um, and I just waited for the moment when I had um, these two ladies were walking in this direction and these two ladies were walking in the other direction. It was, you know, the decisive moment applies to panoramas uh, as, uh, as it does for any other type of photography. And uh, as I said, this became that defining moment when I, I got this image that nobody had seen before uh, of the bamboo forest. Yeah, so this is now moving on to transport, uh, bicycles, um, and a rickshaw here. And um, another um, technique which I like to use, and you'll see this when I show the Tokyo pictures, is what I call photographs that are light, that are on the edge, which is um, I don't mind if things are blurred or out of focus. Uh, because it's just on that very limit um, and it gives the photograph uh, something different, a bit of motion, a bit of action. So uh, the, uh, this is about bowing. Uh, the average Japanese person must bow several hundred times a day. You bow when you buy something, you bow to friends and relatives, TV presenters bow to viewers, old ladies bow to the driver when they show him their free bus pass. This makes it easy for the foreigner to cope with new social situations. When in doubt, bow. <laughs> so this is an excerpt from uh, Simon Hoggart's The Land of the Dancing Beer Can. So uh, these are the famous uh, bullet trains, of course, and they have these conductors and even the people selling things on the train. You know, they come in, they bow, they bow when they leave from the carriage, uh, and it's just uh, lovely to see. So this is another scene from uh, Kyoto Station with uh, another bullet train in the background. I should point out that these trains run to military precision. They actually arrive on the exact second, not just minute, but on the exact second. Um, as I said before, uh, Japanese packaging is wonderful and if you see the vending machines, you know, you would not have seen anything like this in Europe. They're just beautiful. 
beautifully laid out, clean. Um, and if you look again at Japanese advertising, it has a particular graphic style um, all of its own. Okay, so now we're going to move uh, towards um, Mount Fuji. And this is another uh, panorama of the uh, Shiraito waterfalls, as they're called. So let me show you how that looks. I'll choose the second one here. So again, a famous scene um, and the panoramic technique again makes it possible to actually capture the whole scene as if you were there. And when I compared my photos, if you like, with the other photographers, um, you could only capture details of this uh, with a normal camera. But, you know, the panoramic capture just allows you to see the place um, as, it, as it is. So, uh, Mount Fuji, uh, the, the holy mountain, um, right, and uh, a wonderful moment when a small cloud just appeared right on top of it. And uh, here you can actually see Mount Fuji on the left, uh, and uh, again, this is, it doesn't look it, and this is again, I think, something that's wonderful about panoramas with landscape pictures, because there is no uh, strong horizontals, uh, you do not get the feeling that it's a panorama. You do not get the telltale signs that it's a panorama, so it just looks like a normal picture, but this is in fact a stitched cylindrical image. Um, a wonderful uh, lunch. Uh, everything was, was given to us raw and we had to cook it for ourselves in a charcoal fire. And uh, again, I had a, a wonderful moment when I asked the owner where I, if I could see the, the roof. Um, and I went up and this is a traditional Japanese building and it's, it's beautiful because there are no metal parts, there's no nails. Everything is kind of by hand kind of stitched together uh, with bamboo and wood and uh, when I created a photosphere I had I had a bit of a shock because this is what actually appeared <laughs> so uh, it was quite funny I kind of felt like I was blessed uh, that somebody was kind of looking over me um, because you know Japanese are very spiritual and they believe you know in the power of uh, things, you know, uh, they believe in the power of mountains uh, and lakes and spirits and this was almost like a spirit was kind of uh, looking over what I was doing. So uh, another shrine, uh, this is kind of water that the people drink uh, in the shrine and again this is a lucky uh, charm. Uh, and uh, by this time I have to say I started to really understand what this was all about and um, I had uh, an epiphany if you like in the forest because I started to look at these memorial stones and I started to understand how everything works uh, uh, and, and what this country was, was like and uh, I absolutely love these, these, uh, the, the pictures and the colors, uh, the juxtaposition of the tombstones with the trees. Uh, and this was uh, a, a freezing cold moment uh, on, uh, on the lake, uh, Lake Yamanaka, which is again close to Mount Fuji. You can see that in the background. And uh, it was so bright. Um, and to get detail in the front, I actually used uh, two uh, Lee filters, two graduate filters, one on top of one another, to actually be able to balance the exposure. So Momonosato, this is the uh, the the land of peaches, as it's called in Japan, and. Uh, this was a funny moment of Japanese tourists uh, wandering about with their guide and uh, I love their expressions as they were walking around. This is a funny picture because I love the uh, the icon in the middle. Uh, I don't know, I don't think that's a Japanese character, but I thought that was quite a funny picture. 
And uh, now we're in Tokyo. Um, and of course, Tokyo is totally different. And in Tokyo, you, you have to kind of adopt a different style because in Tokyo, everything happens incredibly quickly. So these are my photographic, my photographic bodies. And, um, you know, in Tokyo, you have to keep your eyes open because just things happen, uh, as I said, in milliseconds right in front of you. So, uh, and, and this is what you feel in Tokyo. Um, the Japanese have taken the ceremony of city life to heights of holy precision and counted only in the West's nightmares. In the West, the realization that one is a cog in a machine is a source of shame, a reason for rebellion. In Tokyo, when you realize what a damn near flawless and unprecedentedly magnificent machine you're a perfect cog in, it is, on the contrary, a matter of blissful contemplation. So that's uh, Peter Popham, uh, Tokyo, the city at the end of the world. So, uh, you know, you see, um, again, they, they have their personal space. You, you do not see people pushing and shoving each other. Uh, and everybody is very orderly uh, queuing and very orderly getting onto the bus and then you see on the buses of course the uh, the bus drivers wear gloves uh, and everything is meticulously clean again the taxi drivers uh, wear gloves and you know they they keep shining their uh, the vehicles uh, you see a lot of people um, putting on masks and and I thought originally that this was something to do with the pollution actually it isn't uh, they are so respectful that if they've got a cold they actually put a mask so that they don't actually spread uh, the germs to uh, to the rest of the public okay so this is uh, this is about Japanese technology of course so this is the Nissan showroom um, and again, this is a moment taken through a window of a sales lady on the left uh, talking to a potential potential client. Uh, the uh, Nikon house, uh, this is in Ginza district. It's a great place to buy secondhand equipment. Um, don't take your credit card because it will be used often. Uh, and this is a Yoda Bash camera, one of the big kind of uh, camera stores. Um, and this is Akihabara, the electronics district. And you can get any any gadget, anything from here. There's you know electronic parts. So uh, now we we are in Tokyo. Uh, this was quite a funny moment. These two couldn't make up their mind whether they were going to cross the road or not. And this sign appeared on the back says "Time to choose." Um, and um, I quite like this picture because it was like taken um, as I was moving along, and I, I love the uh, I love the effect that it's produced. And this is, of course, it's a, it's a picture about shopping, and I, I like the juxtaposition of the you know the black dress uh, with the white pedestrian lines on the street. Um, and uh, these are salesmen, of course. It's it's very much a, a capitalist society, uh, so they do like to sell things. And um, and I, I, I as I said, I adopted a different style here. I am not not shooting panoramas, but actually just doing street photography. But letting the letting the motion just blur a little bit, just to be on the edge, as I said, just to give the picture something different, just to get, give you a feeling of the high speed with which everything was moving uh, in Tokyo. Uh, and I, I also like this picture, and I took this picture because um, it showed me something about the past and the present and about, you know, the the modern kind of more Western approach on the right and then on the left the more kind of traditional approach. And of course, the other thing is, um, the other element, of course, is the umbrella uh, in the middle, which is, again, something you always carry in Tokyo. Uh, trendy young uh, Japanese, um, always very, very friendly to us. And uh, the final part of the trip was in Hiroshima, um, and um, this is the location. So we went by a bullet train from Tokyo. And um, 
the other location that you'll see towards the end is the famous Itsukushima Shrine. Um, so this is obviously the 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 site of the uh, Hiroshima is the site of the uh, the atom bomb. Um, so this is how the city looks today. This is a picture with a fish eye. And of course, um, there are remnants of the explosion throughout the city. Uh, some buildings have been left, and um, this is actually the location of the uh, the explosion, which actually happened uh, 580 meters above this spot. Um, and that was deliberate to to cause, obviously, as much um, devastation uh, as as was possible. So on the left, you actually see a um, What's, what actually happened to the steel, which actually melted on one of the piers of the bridge. And the most famous building, of course, is the A-bomb dome. And uh, uh, if you look on the I-beam, the, in the middle bottom part of the picture, you see the way it's twisted by the explosion. I mean, that just shows you kind of the force uh, of the impact. And uh, I was very, very lucky because um, when you're in Hiroshima, uh, you just cannot escape um, what had happened there. You know, it's part of the fabric. You see it everywhere. And uh, this is kind of how people react. And this is not a post picture. This is how this couple really was. And um, this was my panorama. I, I set up my camera, and I'm going to show you that panorama now. Uh, I, I set up my camera to take the picture of the um, of the famous A bomb dome and of course the river, and I shot I shot one panorama, and uh, uh, what actually happened was a group of tourists appeared to my right, and uh, here they are, and it was rather wonderful because you know, when people are in the picture, it gives it a sense of scale, and it makes it something beyond just a static uh, photograph. So I love the fact that some of them, like this young girl is looking at me, and and the guide, a very typical Japanese guide, is pointing towards the, the scene. But it made it, you know, it made the picture, the people made the picture for me. So it was uh, a good moment. So, um, uh, it's it's a place where uh, the um, a lot of children go, um, uh, and and it was quite interesting. You know, now we're not at war anymore, and one of the girls had a bag that said "I love USA," and I thought that was really great. I love USA, um, and these are the children uh, play, uh, praying for peace uh, next to the uh, memorial. And this is actually the memorial, and there's a, a wonderful museum there. And uh, these are just some of the things that struck me in the museum. On the right, we see the black rain that came um, after the explosion. And on the left, what we believe is actually a person that was actually standing there or sitting there, and they were vaporized. So all that became of the person was just a shadow on the rock. Uh, here, the actual explosion was so bright that it actually made the shadow imprinted onto the, the wall itself. And the other uh, story is that there was a young girl who was uh, dying out of um, uh, cancer from uh, basically the um, from from the ex the effect of basically the the explosion. And uh, her mother uh, asked her to make uh, a paper crane, basically, to keep her busy. So she started to make all these cranes. And the crane has now become a symbol of peace. So wherever you go to Hiroshima, you actually see thousands of cranes made by the children of Japan uh, spread, uh, spread all over. And uh, this is the final part. Uh, you'll be pleased to know. Um, so this is really about love, actually, because uh, by this time, after about 10 days, I was incredibly tired of carrying all my equipment, uh, but I felt a sense of achievement and a, and a sense of love uh, for this country. And it was appropriate because um, I was at this, again, famous site, which is opposite Hiroshima, 
Um, these are cockle uh, gatherers, if you like. Again, beautiful light in overcast sh uh, shadow. Uh, this is uh, the famous gate. Uh, it was not in water, unfortunately, but still looks quite good. And again, that juxtaposition of the two main religions in Japan. This is a guy uh, painting, and you can actually see the exquisite precision with which um, he's doing his job. Uh, and this is, again, uh, completely by luck. I, I saw uh, a gathering of people, and I went to find out what it was. And it was a Japanese wedding. Wow. So uh, my last full day in Japan, and I get to see a wedding. And uh, I took these pictures, and I actually became friends with the bride and the groom. Um, and uh, we still uh, speak over email to this day. And uh, this was, again, a great moment. The three wonderful ladies in kimonos. And here, some, somebody said something which I did not understand, of course, in Japanese. And uh, the girls started laughing. And again, in that typical Japanese way. So it was a wonderful moment. And uh, the final day, uh, we were just in Tokyo for a few hours. So I got a night view uh, of the Tokyo Tower. And uh, very soon after that, I got back on the flight to London. And that was, that was two weeks in Japan. So uh, I, hope, uh, I hope it's been interesting, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, seeing this presentation. So thank you very much. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, I'd be, uh, I'd be very happy to, uh, to answer. Okay, great, uh, Michael. That was a pleasure seeing all these impressions and all how you do, how you work, your techniques, and uh, uh, how you work with our products. And um, therefore, we will come to an end in a few seconds. First, I'd like to give you some uh, information where you can get more information about our products. There's the very first one here. We have, for all those who want to learn more about color management from a photographer's perspective, we have a so-called spider ebook. Um, that's uh, a book written uh, from perspective of a photographer. And it was a, pro a photographer and uh, uh, together with um, a guy from a very famous photo um, shop magazine. It's uh, the um, Dogma here over in Germany. And uh, they wrote this book together. And the best, it, it is for free. You will find it at our website. Please use the QR, uh, QR code or use the link. I will show the link later afterwards also. But also information you will find um, at uh, YouTube or datacolor.spider.datacolor.com as well. And of course, in Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube, RSS feed, you find also information on data color products. And if you have additional questions, please feel free to call us at 00800-700-870. Uh, it's from 9 to 12 and uh, 1.30 to 5.30 continental time. Or, you see, because it's sometimes a, a longer explanation, and therefore it could be good to submit a ticket, uh, because it's 24 hours, 7 days a week, free of charge, of course, support.datacolor.com. And uh, so we are, have more webinars to come. And um, so you're invited to come back again to register for the next webinar. So that brings us now to the end. And uh, what I will do, I will um, open the question part. You can all enter all the questions you have. and. Uh, we will do the question and answer section now, so thank you.